I think uh, this panel is going to be very intriguing for you because you don't hear a lot about this subject and how it's related to AI. My first guest for the panel is a renowned international expert in anti-money laundry. She has been working in very challenging geographies in the field, places like Kenya, Ethiopia, Jordan, and Djibouti. She is now program manager for Egmont, which is the worldwide organization for financial investigation units. Please welcome Ms. Liat Chitrit. My next guest is a data scientist from a very prominent company, Actimize Nice. He's actually working with all the major banks in the world to identify fraud, risk, and money laundering. Please welcome Simon Robbins. Okay, now I get to sit down, which is a uh, kind of an improvement of uh, what I've been doing. Uh, my, my first question being um, to the odd, are you like a money laundering expert or an anti-money laundering expert? Good morning, David, and, and good morning, everyone. I think we have competition with a shakshuka outside, so I'll be compelling and interesting and try to keep you here with us. Um, so once you're an anti-money laundering expert, you therefore are also a money laundering expert. And it's definitely the case that I've been um, chasing dirty money, illicit funds across um, Africa and the Middle East. And if there's one thing that I'm really keen on is um, the idea that people in this room are going to solve the major pain point slash the pain system that is involved in money laundering and terrorism finance. And it's really something that I've seen again and again loads of data, structured, unstructured data, and an absolute inability on our part as um, members of government or, or public servants to make good sense of them. And I said, okay, the solution is in the bank. So I joined a big bank and then I was disappointed because we weren't doing things fast enough. And, and you see in the, uh, in the ground, on the field, uh, there's tremendous issues, bazillions of dollars that are just um, uh, going downhill and we have a lot of opportunity to find solutions and I think it's going to come from this country and I think it's going to come from this room. So um, thanks for having me. Simon, uh, welcome to our panel. Thank you. You came from Haifa, which is pretty okay. far, right? Mm -hmm. To the land of Tel Aviv. <laughs> yeah. uh, nice uh, too, quick words before we dive in. I can see the, uh, we have the first picture on the screen. So just tell us a little bit about what we're going to do. Do you want to go ahead? I can go ahead. Sure, yeah. So um, this is a traditional um, machine, washing machine. We all have them. And um, when we talk about making dirty money clean, it's kind of the classic image that we have to, to depict. So when we talk about money laundering, just so we're all on the same page, money laundering is the process of concealing the source of dirty funds by basically putting it through some sort of cleansing process. And um, in, in the theoretical models, there are three stages of, the, of this, where you place the money, the dirty money that you got through embezzlement or corruption or, or proceeds of crime into um, the system, whether it's you deposit in a bank, you convert it into, you buy a car, you buy a house, you do whatever you want to do it, and then you layer it. And what that means is you create a line that's blurry and fuzzy to, to distance you from that asset, to distance you from that car. So you resell it, you resell the house, you, you fix it up, you create um, distance between you and that dirty money, and then you basically um, uh, benefit from the wealth that you've created by um, selling the house and getting the cash, um, selling the car and getting that cash, and then you have just clean money, which came as a result of your car. Now, just to distinguish from terrorism financing, which we talk about, um, so terrorism financing is, is more about the source of funds, which could either be legitimate or illegitimate. Terrorism financing can come from someone's paycheck, or it could come from specifically fundraised money. So the, the, the difference between terrorism financing and money laundering is essentially the source of, fun, of funds, whether it's dirty money, or clean money or dirty money used. And, and I think within that whole process, there are um, a bunch of opportunities for um, AI to help 
resolve a lot of these um, uh, big issues. Okay, so, you know, before yeah. jumping into the AI, uh, and, uh, and sorry for jumping in, so I'm, I'm a law-abiding citizen, uh, most of us are, paying taxes. Why do I care about money laundering? I mean, how does it touch me? How does it touch David? Sure. Well, um, first of all, many of us in this room, including David, um, touches on uh, money, and which means you have regulatory compliance issues that um, are hitting us. The other thing is our traditional terrorism financing challenges. There is a lot of money that is supporting terrorism. It's supporting illicit crime. Um, and we have uh, an obligation, an opportunity to do something about it. I don't know, Simon, if you want to jump in on this one. Yeah, I'll just say um, for, ter for terrorist financing, as a... I work for a company that um, is one of the leading uh, um, solution vendors in the space of AML, work with the biggest banks. And the problem we find with terrorist financing uh, in particular is that it's very often very small amounts. Um, money laundering can be large amounts, it makes it easier to find. Here we're talking about to, to, to have a terrorist event could require a very small amount of money. If you look at the 9-11 attacks, for example, um, there you're looking at the cost of um, some box cutters and maybe a copy of Microsoft Flight Simulator. That, that was basically what it cost to, to launch that whole attack. Um, I had a, we had a case not, not that long ago, actually from Toronto, a, a new charity that was set up. Um, they, sent, they sent money to uh, Somalia. And normally you'd expect people who want to do charitable work with Somalia, they work with, a, with an established charity, Red Crescent, Red Cross. In this case, a new charity, they sent money to Somalia and we saw that they were bringing over three Afghani nationals to, to Somalia. And it, it turned out that they weren't you know, sanitation engineers. They were, they, they, they were up to uh, no good, as you say. So, so these are examples. This is an example where the amount of money was, was pretty small. Um, it was just uh, enough to buy some plane tickets. But on the other hand, um, we had, uh, in this case, a rule-based system that managed to catch it. Um, it's a new charity, for example. It's the first time they've ever really transferred money to where they're transferring it to. But what our hope is for the far future is that AI will help in finding the different combinations that maybe we can't pick up in these uh, more simple rules. So on, on the TF, just one more point would be that the transactions nowadays for, for a big staged attack is anywhere between $10,000 to $15,000, if not even cheaper, a knife attack. And finding these aligning uh, the finances with um, motivation and ideological interest is something that is certainly on everyone's mind. Um, the next bit would be around narcotics and, and illegal drugs. Um, this is a huge market. It's, um, it's impacting source countries, destination countries, and not to mention the, the, market, the sub markets that are being created in between. Um, and these are illicit financial flows that carry loads of data because they integrate into existing financial networks. And, and this is a, a huge issue. Um, I bring it straight back home, you know, you know, talking to you, David, talking to people in the audience. Um, the toy industry. The toy industry is plagued with issues, whether it's cocaine, you know, Woody from Toy Story, um, all, these, all these different characters that um, are really uh, either used as, as sub-cargo shipments when toys are shipped, um, there's there's a there's a, a bunch of different points, and we'll talk about points of intervention in a moment. Cultural goods and artifacts um, are being uh, um, uh, brought forward into marketplaces, whether it's auctions online, um, uh, whether it's fraudulent activities around these, and, and it's creating a lot of issues in uh, re rebuilding war-torn countries. I've seen this in Iraq, I've seen this in Saudi and Syria. This is a really big issue. Um, and of course, you know, our, our wildlife, our ecosystem. Is that a it, unicorn? That's definitely a unicorn. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we talk about elephants in the room, we talk about the rhinos in the room. Um, uh, I, I, this is destroying our country, our countries, and our eco and wildlife systems. And um, it's, it's really depressing. So uh, I'm here to tell you that, you know, David, you're about to be depressed by this. And I'll just go ahead and ask you, you know, everything we've just mentioned, what do you think the size? of the illicit financial flows that you go around in all of these markets. Mon dirty money? What's the dirty money amount that's like not being taxed, that's not making it to welfare systems, that's escaping our markets? What's tens, the amount? Tens of billions of dollars? Tens of billions of dollars. Okay, Simon? Yeah, so I hear um, figures of like 2 3% of legitimate transaction, uh, or transactions that may be laundered. Um, there are hundreds of billions. All right, so, so annually, um, if you look at it, the money that's actually evading our entire system is $1 trillion, and these estimates are really loose. 
This is $1 trillion that is escaping in illegal, illicit funds that we should otherwise be taxing and putting to good use. We should be using to innovate. We should be using to fund your startups. This is money that's escaping our system and we have opportunities to find solutions and, and, and this is what we're here to do. Do you wanna go ahead and, and talk to us a little bit about our toolbox and what it is that we, we currently have versus what we could yeah. have? So today we're talking about uh, regulatory environment. The, each, nearly each, com each country will have their own uh, regulator, will set the rules, and there's, a, um, there's an umbrella body as well that sets directives that each regulator is supposed to follow. And in, in each individual country, they'll, um, they'll legislate laws um, related to, uh, to AML, anti-money laundering. Um, the problem is you have a regulator, what do regulators do? They make rules. So you end up with uh, rule-based systems. Um, there's and, certain. And did that solve the problem? I mean, isn't that solved? You guys um, are selling tens of millions think, of dollars. Um, that solved. Yeah, rule-based systems. A lot of people who work in data science will know get you 80% of the way. Maybe okay. they'll get you a long way. And we have certain events that we have to alert and investigate, and that means that the number one problem that the, the large banks have is a is a big false positive problem there. They have kind of a deluge of these um, events that the uh, the regulator says they have to look at. And this is, uh, this is where um, uh, AI starts coming in. Yeah, in a punitive environment, financially, when banks are being fined all over the place, and it's not just the banks, by the way, um, a lot of reporting entities, meaning those that are obligated to legally file suspicious activity reports with regulators would include people like lawyers or accountants. Um, there's a lot of discussion about including um, other innovation type companies in, in this. There's a lot of defensive suspicious activity reports being filed, meaning that the regulators um, and, and I represent a body that has 159 financial intelligence units from around all, basically the globe. What that means is that we're seeing a lot of defensive filing. So people who don't want to be fined later or don't want to deal with the consequences later down the road, so they're filing a defensive um, uh, suspicious activity report so that in three, four, five years from now, they can say, I raised my red flag. I did my due diligence. And when you flick it, flip it to the regulator side, you're seeing that all we're getting is just a bunch of data. And A, we don't have the systems to handle it. B, the systems we have are based on um, tools that are a patchwork of different systems, legacy systems, um, uh, just the data doesn't speak to each other. Um, and, and we're utilizing things that are developed by the United Nations, it's developed by um, international bodies, and this, this, this missing link of a public and private partnership is really, it's really utterly missing. And so um, uh, strengthening that, that, that notion of how do we bring in private sector, innovative, entrepreneurial tools into the public environment to deal with issues like corruption, to deal with issues of tax embezzlement, and all these offenses and criminal offenses that underlie these flows um, is exactly the, the, the purpose of, of this discussion here. So yes. Do we have an actual use case that you can talk about? Like, uh, I'm gonna skip this one. I'm pretty sure we got this one. What is AI? Yeah. We're just gonna skip that one. Let's go ahead into, into a use case. So can, 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 can you talk a little bit you know, just briefly about uh, structured data versus unstructured data, because I don't, I'm not sure everybody is on the same page, just like 30 quick seconds about what it is that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, um, in, in, in my world, I'm dealing with uh, structured data. That means we're looking at um, transaction details, where the transaction's been, who the transactors are, what countries it's going to, what the amounts are, all the... Uh, auxiliary details, um, reference details you expect around, um, around a transaction. Um, unstructured, I'm personally less, um, I'm less familiar with, but, but I can see here on the example you've got, so you're looking at shipping bills and things like that, where, you, where you're trying to extract information um, from, from documents, basically, um, where it's not, it's not tabular data. Okay. Uh, and, and what are we seeing here? I think, I think that, that requires some explanation. <laughs> what okay. we're seeing here. So, so there's, uh, there's, there's a number of challenges with, um, with, with AML and uh, applying machine learning. So uh, ideally we'd want, uh, we'd want to do supervised models. Um, but, but what do you train the supervised models on? You have to have some sort of uh, target that you're training the models on. In our case, we're looking mainly at um, what are called SARS, uh, suspicious activity reports. These are what, uh, when something triggers, the bank has to report. Right. So we, we want to try and forecast those, um, 
maybe uh, f um, feeding in our rule base, our, our rules into the system and, and finding what's happening there. But what, what we have here is a, is a problem in data science that is an uh, imbalanced class, it's basically these, um, these uh, reports are a very small percentage of the overall transactions. So it needs some, uh, it needs some fairly specialized techniques in order to uh, boost the signal that, that, that you have from these SARS. So you have to down, what's called downsampling, upsampling, there's a few, there's a few different techniques there. Um, what, what we're looking at for supervised learning is predictive models. Um, we're, we're getting there now. Um, I, I would also say around um, another the difficulties we have is again the regulatory um, issues. You have to, at, at a large US bank, they have uh, something called model governance. Um, and, and what that is since the 2008 uh, financial crisis, any, any model that um, exposes the bank to risk has to go through this really long, painful uh, bureaucratic process. Right. Um, I think we are brought some kind of, of a real life use case into our... Uh sure, so, oh, so I brought this, this ship um, and I just really want to talk about the ship for one so moment and share with you that you know today we have over 539 million containers like this that are shipped every year from the top 100 ports globally. And as you can imagine, um, you know, it's really difficult to go through each one of these containers. So just as, a, as an anecdote, it takes about um, uh, two customs inspectors as long as two days to inspect one container. Now look at this ship. This ship is ridiculous. So it means that less than 1% of all containers that actually enter, for example, the US are inspected, less than 1%. What that means is that we have billions of documents that need to be ex inspected um, just to maybe potentially get through a ship like this, and this is one ship. Uh, and, and once you get into a, a, uh, like a bogus uh, bill of laden or, or document bill of laden in hebrew uh, to that mishloch so <laughs> i guess i guess the customs have to go through all these uh, uh, bogus or not bogus and, and they just can't do it so if we had yeah. some kind of a machine that uh, could point out people who like in this area just change do they, they manually change the bill of laden so they can skip or uh, go around some kind of process so they can put that container and there's no way that humans can do that because they have that kind of big data problem. Definitely, so I'll, I'll just share um, you know, a brief anecdote. So, so I was personally working in, in um, the ports in, in Djibouti and, and Somalia off the Gulf of Aden which receive um, shipments directly from, from China, directly from Dubai and um, you've got loads of cargo coming in and usually from the sending ports they keep really good documentation except those that are fraud fraudulent except those that you can't really recognize the information from and those that are misrepresented and then in the receiving port they also um, uh, either get paid off to receive shipments they shouldn't be receiving or um, they receive shipments that are, for example, labeled as 100 new Mercedes cars, except they forgot to account for the 10 kilos of cocaine per car. Uh, and so you've got this cycle of um, illicit flows that are added in, and having a, a machine learning solution that could A, flag fraudulent documents, and um, uh, just have a, an overall better system. And again, this is not my area. I just know of the plenty of pain that we see on the ground um, and know that the solutions are out here somewhere. Yeah, so, so what, we're, um, what we're experimenting with at the very least is um, uh, unsupervised systems as well. Right. Um, so that's, uh, that goes down to uh, clustering uh, sort of solutions where we're looking at, um, where, where, where we're looking at uh, clustering, segmenting populations, looking at getting different peer groups together. So we're looking that different um, companies, different individuals work like other individuals and when there's something anomalous we can, we can flag that. So speaking about anomalies, you know, mm -hmm. there's this famous uh, story that was all over the news about an Iranian uh, shipping uh, company which had several ships under its flag and they were doing a, a very special route across the globe and picking up some suspicious stuff. Uh, some of the stuff was labeled milk babies, milk powder for babies, and it was an RDX. Now, uh, by incident, it's very difficult to find out how to uh, trail those ships. Imagine, 
hundreds of ships, hundreds of ports. Uh, you can't, and that's what they do. They defy all the rules that they have. And one of the things that we can do, I think, on the next slide is try to cluster uh, the route of ships to tell you, you know, this is route, maybe a normal route, and then a human would look in and say, okay, this route is something that we want to look at just by clustering. Do you have any experience with, with, with clustering? Yeah, we have we have some uh, some geographical geolocation models that, that, that we can, we can definitely um, we we can do we, we can do some location clustering like that. Um, the the other things we're we're experimenting with is just anomalous transactions. We're looking I don't know we we're looking at some uh, some deep learning techniques for for doing anomaly detection. Um, we're looking at auto encoders for doing that, for example, which is uh, which is quite exciting for us. Um, and and we've, we've, seen, we've seen some good results with that. So, so working with banks, I, I, I wanted... Uh, yeah, so we're talking about the uh, tier one banks. If we had uh, JP Morgan, Chase here before, Citibank, the big US banks. Um, the Japanese banks now are very into, um, are very into the machine learning because the, uh, the, the Japanese regulator has now basically mandated. They come up with a strict guideline. If you know how regulators talk, um, you'd be stupid not to follow it. Uh, any strict guideline they come out that, where they're actually mandating um, some sort of machine learning. Um, they haven't exactly said what that's going to be, but all the other regulators um, around the world are looking at that experiment very closely to see what happens and to, see, to make their next move as well. David, I just want to add here, just sticking with this example for a moment, is there's a lot of power here because in identifying routes that are potentially suspicious or red flagging, you can also get into um, enforcement. And what I mean by this is, for example, if you have a global regime that talks about um, uh, blockades of economic activity between particular countries or sanctions or seizures, this is an enforcement tool because you can clearly see the routes. You can red flag uh, potential areas of risk, and and in, and nowadays, you know, we're looking at a at banks that are really risk averse and and um, becoming uh, less interested in exploring, and yet we have tools that can help us manage high risk clients better. There's a reason that we're able to keep in a bank a high end Nigeria Nigerian diamond dealer or the cannabis industry because we're investing more resources and tools in managing that risk. Now, imagine if we did that across sectors. That's power, and that's tremendous, and it's, 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 under, it's underutilized. So we have uh, three more minutes, and uh, I wanted us to be able to give the folks here a, a few takeaways. But, but before that, just a quick question that really on the top of my lips. Everybody's talking about AML, and you talked about those banks that are buying the system. Mm -hmm. Liat, why have the 10 biggest banks in Europe have all been fined for trafficking and laundering money from HSBC to uh, Ben Pepariba? I mean, what the hell is going on? So with the fines, I mean, beyond the, the, the legal compliance, reputational risks that come with fines, um, when you look at the structure of the fine, it's really interesting because if you're selling a particular tool to help them do better in compliance, when they receive the fine, it usually comes with a contract. The contract means that they need to invest a certain amount in technology to do better. They need to invest a certain amount in their systems. But when these big banks are really functions of mergers and acquisitions, they haven't taken time to clean up their back end. And the data is a mess. You've got legacy system about, upon legacy system. The data doesn't speak to each other. You cannot get a proper read on what's happening. And the front end all has the same streamlined logo and beautification. And I don't mean to slam on banks. I've worked with them. I want to be helpful and constructive. I just want to put the message out. Clean up the back, the back room. You know, if you, if you want people to come in and help you innovate, you need to, to fix the backyard. So I can uh, slam on HSBC because they're not one of my uh, customers. <laughs> but if you, if you look at, um, if you, if you look at the, the huge fines, the, the billion dollar, multi-billion dollar fines, that's where the actual um, banks have kind of almost colluded in the, uh, they've kind of known what's going on, um, that, that, that this money's coming in through, through the back door. Um, what, through the front door. Yeah, through coming the front in through front the door. front door. Uh, what's, what's important in Africa is, is sub-Saharan Africa, as I understand, the very small, um, the very small businesses aren't, can't get trade finance because it's, it's considered too risky. Um, and even still, we're seeing that you know a, a huge amount of the of the trade coming out of there is uh, is illicit in some way. So I mean, completely echoing what you said, they need um, 
better digi digitization, better systems talking to each other, and uh, hopefully eventually you know, uh, AI machine learning systems. And I think I would just add that, you know, when we look at developing countries or lower capacity countries, cash is still king. So it's, it's, it's king and it's queen and it's judge and jury, it's everything. Cash is still out there. Right. And I think the biggest challenge, you know, when we look at it from a regulatory perspective, we've barely been able to understand how to regulate cash. And now AI is coming in and we're just like locking ourselves up in closets as regulators and saying, well, well, we don't want to deal with that. We don't know cash. Why are we going to get into AI? And I think there's almost an obligation upon industry to say, guys, we're here to partner. We have solutions and, and they're here. How do we integrate? How do we partner? How do we do joint ventures that actually make sense? And I think that's, that's about developing trust between industries. Um, and saying, well, we have solutions, you have really big problems, um, let's work on that together. And we have a bunch of data sets within the money laundering, anti-money laundering world that we don't know how to make sense of. And So we have one do. more minute. Yeah. Um, maybe we have a, a wrap up that Simon can yeah. take us my, through for, my, for, for what, what's the takeaways? My, my takeaway is, um, is actually, to, again, to do the regulatory side of it, that the, uh, the, the regulation basically uh, makes it very difficult. Any model you, you, you make in the, in the AML space is going to have to be uh, explainable. You're going to have to say exactly what it is you've done, every single parameter, and for any transaction you're flagging, you have to say exactly why. And to get to that, to get to that place, you obviously have to have all of the things you can see here, the organization and the bias and, uh, and all those things. But, but that's, where, that's, where you, that's the ultimate endpoint. Uh, ten more seconds because I'm the master of ceremony, so I'm going to steal some time <laughs> just to wrap up. Yeah. Sure. So, so from my end, I would say that if you, as as a young startup or as a company, are dealing with uh, with money, please take care of your anti-money laundering obligations because you're a new industry and you're going you're going to get hit hard by a lot of regulators that don't know what you're doing they don't understand what you're doing and they might not want to know what you're doing so protect yourselves and and understand what your legal obligations are especially if you're working globally across jurisdictions sending receiving funds um, um, conduct a risk assessment of your own um, areas of weakness whether it's your product or your service because this is what I've been seeing a lot is that um, um, there's a lot of excellent products that are being shared globally but they don't do their own risk assessments for themselves and they end up getting slammed with fines and you're like why why are they getting slammed with fines please don't do that and also weigh in on regulations the EU is looking to regulate you weigh in on their regulation approach and, and have a say as industry um, and I think that's a good opener for... Well, thank you, uh, both Liat and Simon. Thank you very much.